I'd like to start by, in the name of the CFA Society in Mexico, I'm delighted to introduce Monish Paprai. Monish Paprai is a very successful investor in his firm, Paprai Investments. He's a big fan and he's very clear about being a big fan of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, which I think is something that aligns perfectly with what us as financial analysts try to achieve as a subjective. Those who were in the call before might be puzzled by us talking about Blackjack. One of the things that he's very, or one of his achievements, and as he mentioned, he's very honored to, to be banned of a casino of by having a strategy that wins in, in Las Vegas. But more to the point in the conference, he's also the author of a couple a couple books, the most famous of which is Dandor Investments, which has been translated to a number of languages. The part where his card endeavors and his finance endeavors match, I think it's in one of his principles, which is to bet heavily when the odds are overwhelmingly in your favor. So without further ado, I'd like to not waste more time and to, to make the most out of picking Monish's brains, which I'm sure could be quite profitable. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Javier. It's a, a true pleasure and honor to be, be with uh, CFA Society Mexico members. CFA does a lot of good work around the world. I'm not sure I would be able to pass all the CFA tests. So thankfully, I was able to set up my business without taking any of the CFA exams and somehow have been hacking my way through. I think you get a lot of benefit and discipline when you go through the CFA program, which is pretty demanding. I think we could we could keep this in a Q&A format, if that's what you prefer. We can talk about pretty much anything you'd like to, anything that you have in your mind. I think I might hesitate a bit on is just current portfolio position. Other than that, you know, it's open season. The more time we spend talking about blackjack, the happier I am. So that's okay too. So please feel free. And if you could just, when you ask a question, just tell us a sentence about yourself. That'd be great. Okay. Well, actually, I would probably like to start right. since I since I already have the mic open. Having it's great to have like a, such an open conversation with a successful value investor. I would say I'm I'm a value investor. I'm, I'm the treasurer at Scotia Bank in the daytime, guitar player nighttime, and very, very occasional card player. That's going to disappoint you because I feel the odds are in my favor and I, I don't like <laughs> betting where, when the odds are in my favor. But going into the conference topic into value investing, I mean, in my experience, and I've had, I guess, like most people, a couple of great successes and a couple of great failures. But what I see is, you know, usually when you look at a company or industry and the multiples are like overwhelm overwhelmingly look good. You know, first I started and I found all the companies that had legal troubles and all these asbestos suits. And then I kind of started reading the legal part of the. But usually what I, see, what, what I see and that's where I'd like to pick your brains is that Usually when you see something that has like a really low price earning and has had strong earning and sounds like a stable business and all the things that you're looking for, looks like when you go into these stocks, barring a couple of great exceptions, which are usually like forgotten stocks, the market seems efficient-ish to me in the sense that once you're in, the bad news starts coming in that justifies such a low PE or whatever opportunity seem to seem to be there. So I like to, what would be like your, your tips into finding the, you know, the real businesses from the value traps would be the, the bottom of the question, I guess. Yeah, Javier, that's a great question. And, you know, I, I have uh, practiced different styles of investing. They're all within the value investing tent. It's a very large tent. And within that tent, you can do many, many different things. For, for example, recently, you know, Buffett was buying the stock of Activision Blizzard, which is in the midst of a, being acquired by Microsoft. And the market believes 
that that deal will not go through. And so the spread between the price that Microsoft is willing to pay and the price at which Activision Blizzard, I haven't looked at it recently, but the price at which it was trading or is trading is a very wide spread. But Buffett mentioned at the annual meeting that uh, the reason he bought the stock is purely merger arbitrage. He believes that statistically it is high probability that that deal will close. And if it does close, you capture that gap. We have a similar gap with Twitter where Elon Musk has, you know, asked or, you know, has a deal to buy the stock at a particular price and the market doesn't believe that that's going to happen. A lot of people believe that he can get out of it, you know, which we will find out in a few weeks. So I think both of those cases would be part of value investing. You had some reason to believe that these were high probability events that Activision Blizzard is likely to be bought by Microsoft and, the Twitter deal might get done. Maybe there is a small adjustment, but mainly gets done around the price that is agreed. And you made those bets, then that's a very valid way to go about it. What I think is the, the best way to invest is to focus on the great business. There are many things you could do merger arbitrage, buy a business that's trading well below liquidation value maybe below cash. And there are a number of different ways in which you can protect downside. But generally speaking, the way you will make the most money is by the partial ownership of a business which has tremendous economics and, and a tremendous run. If you are in the happy position of the ownership of a tremendous business, the tremendous runway, for the most part, you only need to be right once or twice in a lifetime. And it would cover a lot of sins. Recently, there was a lot of coverage about a Indian investor, Rakesh Chunjunwala, who just passed away. I didn't know him, but I have friends who are close friends of his. So he's kind of a friend of a friend. Rakesh was 62 years old. He was in poor health. He passed away with a net worth of over $4 billion. All of it was from the market and he never managed outside money. I mean, if he had decided to open an investment advisory business, billions of dollars would have come to him, but he wasn't interested in it. So he just managed his own money. And when he first, when he first started, he's a, he's a, a chartered accountant, a CPA. When he first started, maybe in his early 20s, about 40 years ago, he had no money. He had absolutely like zero. He, he went to this lady and requested her to give him a loan of about $25,000 so he could buy some stocks. So the lady told him, if I give you this money, what is the guarantee? What guarantee can you give me? What collateral will I get? So he said, look, the only collateral I can give you is my signature. I have nothing else. I have no assets. So you should only give me the money if you trust me. So she didn't fully trust him because he is, he's an unknown guy. But she tells him, okay, listen, here's what you do. You take the $25,000. i am going to first give you $12,500. You go buy stocks with the $12,500 and then you give me those shares. I will hold custody to those shares. They are your shares. The upside belongs to you but that's my security. So he said, done. He also agreed to pay her 18% interest for the money, which is, you know, I would say this was a different time, probably early 80s, you know, normally you would, in India, you would borrow at 12, 13%. Rakesh paid 18%. And, and then, you know, he started to invest and he was a, you know, I would say he was a split brain. He did a lot of rapid fire trading, but he also had two, really long-term holds. So there's a company in India called Titan Industry, which I think he invested in maybe 20 or 25 years ago. And when he made that investment in Titan Industries, it was like three or 4% of his portfolio. He never sold a share till he died. He died with those shares. 
And uh, out of the 4 billion, around 2 billion was Titan. And Titan compounded at something around 30% a year, 30 or 35% a year for a, a long, for more than two decades. And actually, if you study Titan, I don't want to go off track because your, your members won't have much interest in studying Titan. But if you study Titan, basically, it's, it's a jeweler. And in India, you know, the only jewelers you would do business with was ones that your family had done business with for a long time. So you could have some trust. Because you know, when you're buying gold, you don't know whether it's fake or real or whatever else. Titan was, uh, it, it was promoted by one of the large Indian conglomerates who was very trusted. And so they had natural trust. Indian jewelry was very fragmented. And now Titan is gradually consolidating that. It's, in my opinion, Titan still has maybe a 50-year runway ahead of it. It's got a huge runway ahead because it's so, uh, but, but to Rakesh's, to give Rakesh credit, company went through lots of ups and downs, but he understood the business. And when it became 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% of his portfolio, he was least bothered about it, just kept it. And then there was another company, Lupin, which is the pharmaceutical industry. And I think Lupin became 25, 30% of his portfolio. So he was doing a lot of rapid fire trading every day. He had three screens in front of him and all of that. And he'd buy stuff at 10 o'clock and sell it at two o'clock, whatever else. I think that was just to keep his mind occupied. Okay, very smart guy. But these two stocks with the guy who's doing this rapid fire trading and had a view on the market and view on every wiggle that the stocks market is doing and so on, he never touched these companies. And the reason these companies did well was that they were great businesses. And he never sold them even when they looked optically overpriced. So Titan became an, a market darling. Everyone loved Titan after 20 years. They understand the story really well. And it's like Costco. You know, everyone understands Costco. Everyone loves Costco or Walmart and, and so on. But so one of the important things in investing, which you know, is a departure from Ben Graham. While Ben Graham is regarded as the father of value investing, he also did, in my opinion, some disservice to us value investors. Because ben, ben Graham had a an edict that was cast in stone. And the edict was that a stock should not be held above its intrinsic value. And actually, with due respect, and I hope you will pardon my blasphemy, the correct model, I believe, would be like the Buffett, Munger, or Chuck Akery model, which would be like, like Chuck Akery is a great example. And I think maybe you can see if you can get him to speak to you guys. Chuck Akery asked a question. He doesn't ask the question, is the stock above intrinsic value? He asked the question, is the business getting better? And if the business is getting better, then you need to give the out of room. So let's say Titan is growing 15, 20% a year. And let's say the multiple, the trailing multiple is a PE of 40 for example, or a PE of 50, very high, right? According to Rakesh, it is very clear the business keeps getting better. The more stores they open, the deeper the moat gets because they can amortize their designs over a larger uh, pool and the wider the distance grows between them and their competitors. And so while you would not buy Titan at 50 times trailing earnings or 40 times trailing earnings, maybe even 30 times trailing earnings, you should not sell it. So there is an asymmetry in investing which Ben Graham didn't talk about or probably even didn't believe in, where at a certain price, I would not buy a stock, but I wouldn't be wanting to sell it. And so I think that when we make investment, so this asymmetry, you know, between what price you would buy a stock at and what price you'd be willing to sell a stock at. So let me, let me take a slight uh, detour. The very nature of capitalism is that if 
someone has a great moat and is making super normal profits. There are lots of incentives with lots of entrepreneurs and businesses to go into that business and wipe out those super normal profits. That is the nature of capital, which means that something like Titan going for 30, 40 years, Costco going for 50 years, or Walmart or Southwest Airlines, these anomalies should not exist in capital. If you just took a theoretical point of view, these anomalies should not exist, but they do exist. And the reason they exist is that when an entrepreneur starts a business, the best that they can hope for in almost all cases is some, what I would call arbitrage opportunity, which allows them to make some decent money for some finite period. So for example, if in the Polanco district of Mexico City, there are no sushi restaurants, or no great sushi restaurants, and someone opens a great sushi restaurant there, they will do really well for a while. But once other sushi chefs figure it out and they start opening sushi restaurants next to this guy, those profits will start eroding. Now, if this sushi chef has some secret sauce where nobody can match his quality of food or whatever else, it could become an enduring moat that could go on for a long time. So enduring moats are very hard to predict when you start. But what happens in capitalism sometimes is when you look back, you can identify enduring moats that somehow got built and even look like they might persist for some. And those are the ones to focus on. So one of the reasons the index is so hard to beat. So there are literally just about four or 5% of companies that generate almost all the returns that the index gives you. In the stock market, if you took out those four or 5% of companies, the market returns would be terrible. When we as individual investors are picking stocks, the odds are stacked against us because you have to pick one out of 20. And the odds of being wrong, and especially, you know, you put on a cheapskate a hat and you're trying to buy something cheap. And then you're trying to pick one of these 20 great businesses, cheap. Good luck with that. Very hard to pull off. And the index does so well because the index is too dumb to know that it owns Google too dumb to know that it owns Microsoft, too dumb to know that it owns Costco, and too dumb to sell these things ever. And so it just rides these things. So just like we saw with Rakesh, 3% of his portfolio, which was a really small piece, which was probably at that time, maybe worth less than $50 million or $25 million, becomes $2 billion, okay? And what did he do? The biggest thing he had to do was do nothing. So the holy grail in investing is we will make a lot of mistakes. John Templeton said that the best investor will be wrong two out of three times, or one out of three times. Most of us will be wrong half the time. Even if you're wrong half the time, you can do really well. That's a, this is a very forgiving business. But the important thing is that when you find yourself in the happy position of ownership of a great business, you have to set aside Ben Wall. And if you can see the runway, and you can see that it's a great business and it's gonna keep growing, keep doing well, run by great managers, honest managers, then you just hang on to it for dear life. Now, if it gets egregious, so you can hold a business which is overvalued, but you should not hold it when it's egregiously overvalued. So we might consider Costco overvalued at 40 times earnings or 50 times earnings, but we should hold it. If Costco went to 200 times normalized earnings, it should have been sold a long time because then now we've, you know, we've left the reservation. So sorry for the long answer. That's kind of how I think about it. No, I think it's, it's great that it's a long answer, but it's a great answer. So I'd like to open the floor to see if somebody else would like to ask a question. Yes, we have a, a, a question from Julio. What are your thoughts about Baba? Well, I was hoping to keep the conversation 
out of specific names. Well, I would say Alibaba is a great business. Got into the crosshairs of the Chinese Communist, Communist Party. That's usually not a good thing. They have some very strong moats. They have great management. Probably the business does well. Beyond that, I think you need to do your homework. And one thing I would just generally say is that given how large Baba is and how long a run it has had for the length of period it has that run, it would not be my top pick or maybe even my fifth or seventh pick. So I think that there should be a lot of other business that should be a lot more attractive with probably better economics than Alibaba. Thank you. Mauricio Santos wants to make a question. Hi, Monish. Thanks for the call. Thanks, CFA, for organizing this. I was wondering, what are your thoughts about active management? No? Has it changed across the years? In my view, it, fees going down everywhere, it has become more difficult no? to, to do active management. It seems to me that as a result of this, active management is being secluded to a smaller part of, of the market. I, I would love to, to, to hear your thoughts about this. How, how, how has active management changed throughout time? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So for a long time in the United States, we've had more mutual funds and ETFs than individual stocks, which to me is a stunning statistic. And I think we, we all know the stats that in active management, because the fees and frictional costs are a lot higher, it is almost a law of physics that 80 plus percent of active managers after fees would lag the index. So I think for the know-nothing investor, it is a very good idea to just index because 80% chance that if you pick an active manager, you would have picked someone who would underperform after fees. So the, the picking of great managers is a really difficult exercise. I think picking great managers is much harder than picking great stocks. And so if the odds are set against us in terms of picking great stocks, they are set very much against us picking great managers. Fund management industry is interesting in the sense that 80% of the industry does not add value. It subtracts value, but it continues to exist. So it's kind of like someone sells a substandard product, but they don't go out of business, which doesn't happen in almost any other industry. Fund management is a little bit peculiar from that point of view because of stickiness and recurring nature and, and so on. So I think it will continue. We will continue to have subpar managers and we will continue to see 80 plus percent of, of assets in places where they should not be. And uh, such is life. Thank you very much. Actually, that was a very good question, Mauricio. Yeah, I, I have one question, and I thank you, Javier, uh, for, for moderating the panel, and thank you, Manish, for, for dropping by. What do you make of the argument that, I, I mean, actually, there's two questions. So one, one is, what, what do you make of the argument that value investing is really a, a function of where you are measuring from? Because the entire value investing thesis is you pick thesis that are down in price, hoping that they will go up. That works only if you make up for a selected sample of stocks. So that's question number one. So what do you think about that technical argument? And then the second is, actually, value happens in companies that are, that are growing fast. So if you, if you invested in FAN over the last couple of years, you did pretty well, and you created value. So at one point, the distinction between value and growth is more of a marketing strategy. And at one point, it's really something that is tangential that can be delivered by metrics and by uh, looking at financial statements. Yeah, I'll take your second question uh, first. I might need the first one repeated. I didn't quite get that. Value and growth are joined at, at the hip. There is no such thing as growth investing without value. So all intelligent investing is value investing. The best kind of value investments are ones where the company generates very high returns on equity and has a very high growth rate and has a very long runway, which fits the description of many FANG stocks. Investing in FANG stocks 
is not some departure from value investing. It's actually very much within. In fact, if, if one had a crystal ball and one could see the future cash flows, let's say in the year 2000 or 2002, that Google or Facebook or Microsoft would generate until the day they don't exist, you know, till, till they disappear, and you were able to discount those back, th that would give you a basis to invest in those companies, which would be which would not be debatable. And it is entirely possible that these companies were worth investing in, even at a trailing earnings of 100 or 150, if the future cash flows suggested that. One could have bought Walmart at you know, double or triple the price it was trading at many times in its history, still del delivered double digit analyzed returns. Even, even Buffett has said that, you know, when they bought C's Candy, which they paid like $25 million for, and they've pulled out several billion dollars in dividends so far. I think when they look back, they say that they were not willing to pay a penny over what they offered. But they now say it was dumb. And they are thankful that the owners didn't walk away. But they said that in hindsight, they could have paid $100 million for that business or $150 million for that business. And it would have still been a great investment you know, five or six times of the time. And, you know, that was a business at that time, I think their book value was like seven or eight. Months. So I think that it's in the nature of capitalism that when you get to these kind of really unusual businesses, and, and, and you know, the fangs have a lot of unusualness about them uh, because they're in the business of converting atoms into bits. When you convert atoms into bits and you have some kind of mousetrap that doesn't let others you know, get into your area of converting atoms into bits. You can do really well. I mean, if I if I look at the advertising market, it used to be that people used to say, you know, some advertisers used to say, half my advertising works and half doesn't. I just don't know which half. So that is no longer true when you advertise with Google or Facebook. You know exactly what is working and you know exactly what is not working and you can pinpoint the results, which was not possible for millennia before that. And also a lot of it has consolidated. So a large portion of those advertising dollars end up in very few hands. And, and those, those hands that it ends up in have incredible moats. Now these moats can fill over and they can change over time because these are technology businesses. So I think it's just a matter of being able to figure out what is a sustainable mode, what are the future likely cash flows, what are you paying for those cash flows, and if all of those make good sense and a high probability, then none of those investments are outside of value investment. If you could repeat your first question, I didn't quite get that. Uh, Sorry, your... I was muted. Yeah. yeah. No, the first question is because this entire value versus growth sort of competition, the point that I was trying to make. Obviously, it depends on what benchmarks you use and what kind of uh, analytics you do, but, you know, if you look at one period of time, stocks that are defined as value seem to perform better than, than are classified as growth and vice versa. But that's really a function, in my opinion, that's really a function of where you are measuring from. I, I, I'd rather prefer and I like much more your thesis about sustainable business models and, and, and forget about indices that, you know, try to categorize these stocks as value, whatever seems to be underpriced, and growth seems to be whatever overpriced. That, that was the entire point that I was trying to make. Yeah, that's a great question. So Buffett has a quote that he says that we like to great, we like to buy great businesses when they are on the operating team, where they have hit some hopefully temporary hiccup. So the nature of my psyche is that I can recognize that MasterCard is a great business. I may even recognize that it trading at 30, 40 times trailing earnings is perfectly normal. And it may even be true that paying something like 20 times trailing earnings might be a great price. But someone with my psyche would not be willing to even pay 20 times earnings for a MasterCard. 
it just doesn't fit for me and and that's perfectly okay because this is not a game of called strikes so in baseball you get three strikes and you're out in investing you can let a thousand balls go by so i like microsoft as a business i don't like the price so i could just focus on great businesses that are on the operating okay and when a great business is on the operating table no one's interested so it's kind of like when buffett took the first large position in geico or when he bought i think about 40% of the company there was a lot of fear that the business was going to die uh, they had done some bad underwriting and they were, all their numbers were upside down and their surplus was gone and all of that but he stepped in he changed management he got some breathing room from the from the regulators and in that case he was active in the business but there are many many examples because it's it's in the nature of capitalism that companies don't go straight up in a straight line they are going to ebb and flow and they are going to have issues and hiccups and things that happen to them and so if you have an understanding that whatever has happened to them is a temporary hiccup so one of the advantages we have versus the market is the market tends to overweight short term factors and if we can have a more balanced weighting of the business or over a much longer period that can give us an edge against the market if we have the patience to hold over much longer periods that gives us another edge against the market so for a investor like me i want to have my cake and eat it too so i don't want to pay up for a great business it just doesn't work for me even though it makes all the sense in the world i want to have the great business without paying up and because there are 50000 stocks and because there's some number of them that are on the operating table at any given time if i'm willing to do the work once in a while i'll get a business on the operating table that i can see there's it's a temporary issue and it'll go away and then we can we can do just fine that can work out extremely well hi this is marina mendes speaking and i just have another question that probably is already implied in your previous answers but i just want to get this straight my question is how do you navigate in this kind of like beer, bearish scenario where we have like macroeconomics hitting you know the screen every single minute what do you take what are your takes on you know the short term inflation the interest rate increases you know all these new numbers that that we hear in the states daily basis i think you have to overlay those numbers in the context of a business you might own or want to own so let's say i own a business like costco for example or a business like amazon so how does you know the price of oil affect costco how does inflation affect costco and i think the answer really comes out if i really think about it. yeah the oil prices go up their costs go up their customers have to spend more to get to the store it's a negative and inflation is a negative people have less money to spend and so on and so forth but when i overlay that with the nature of the business which is that they have a sec- secular structural advantage over their competitors i mean costco costco opened two stores in china recently maybe in the last year or so two years and the stores got more like they could not handle and i don't think even now they can handle the volume of the crowds that want to shop at those two stores and those two stores for costco in china are insanely profitable because the volumes are so high so how many stores will costco have in china in 20 years okay we don't know the answer we know it's likely to be more than 2 it might be more than 200 it might even be more than 1000 
We don't know that. If Costco ends up with a thousand stores in China, in the US, they only have 800 stores. But if they end up with thousand stores in, in China, that is a factor that has a huge impact on how well an investor does. So I think that when you find yourself in the happy place of the partial ownership of a great business, the best way to think about it is you think about it like it's your family business. And if your family owned 70% of Costco, somebody came to you and said, hey, can I buy your business? You would say, no, you know, we might have 2,000 stores in China in 20 years. And we are only in 10 countries. And in 20, 30 years, we might be in 30 countries. And we might have 10,000 stores in 30 years, 40 years. Who knows? So because the future possibly looks great, and the probability that the future looks bleak is pretty low, all the other noise coming at us is not relevant. Got it. Completely irrelevant. When, when Rakesh Junjunwala bought Titan, the Indian jewelry industry is very fragmented. No one has even 1% market share. And if you fast forward 30, 40 years, Titan might be 25%. And nobody else might be even 2%. And that runway just continues. You know? And so to, to me, what is important is that those are the factors. That's really what matters. So separate the signal from the noise and ignore the noise. And especially noise that you have a hard time even understanding or sure. calibrating. So who cares what the Fed does? Who cares what inflation is? Who cares what the price of oil is? Who cares what the outcome of Ukraine war is, even though that's a very sad situation? There's a lot of things that don't really matter. And uh, we should focus on the things that are likely to affect. The things that are likely to affect a business the most are factors around the business, not factors around the economy. Great answer. Thank you very much for your time. Sure. Hi, Monish. Thank you for being here. Big fan here. I just wanted to ask you, what's your, like your idea on where is value investing going in the future? You know, it has changed since Ben Graham and the idea of the cigar bots, you know, and now like kind of value growth, you know? And where do you think value investing is going in the future? Charlie Munger tells me that if Warren and he were starting out today, they could not do what they did. He said that when they started out, they used to shoot fish in a barrel after the water had been let out. And so there was relatively few people looking at a relatively large universe of different stocks and assets. Now we have a lot of brain power directed towards, you know, a relatively narrow number of stocks and markets and so on. So anytime you have a large number of intelligent people with a lot of money looking at certain assets, you are generally not going to find a lot of mispriced opportunities. Uh, they'll still exist because if you think long-term, that can give you an edge. I think you have to zag when people are zigging. For the most part, I think I have one stock I own in the US and I own a few stocks in Turkey. No one has any interest in Turkey. It has 80% annual inflation on an official basis. On an unofficial basis, it might be even higher than that. And so everyone and their brother has exited Turkey. When I bring up Turkey to really smart friends of mine who are really good value investors, who moan and groan that they cannot find anything to buy, they immediately dismiss it. I don't want to talk about Turkey. I want to talk about US. The thing is that there is always mispriced securities, underpriced securities in some area or segment that is usually hated or unloved. And most people do not want to go into places that are hated and unloved. But if you're willing to go to some of those places, so like, I mean, I would say in Turkey, it's really simple. It's really difficult to invest in a place 
with 80% or higher inflation and do well in dollars. But there are some businesses in Turkey where all their revenue is in euros or 95, 98% of the revenue is in euros and almost all their costs are in lira. And something like every 10% drop in the lira increases their euro earnings by two, three, four percent. So actually, high inflation is a tailwind. So for example, there's a fruit juice company in Turkey. I don't own this company, but it's giving you an example. Where 90%, 98% of the revenue is exports into the European Union. So Turkey is part of the European common market. It can export to the European Union with no duties or tariffs. So all their revenues come from euro, in euros, from Europe. Their expenses are the payments they make to the Turkish farmers and the processing and all of that, that happen. Those payments keep declining in, in euros and the revenues are stable. But it's been taken out back and shot because it's in Turkey. And therein lies the opportunity. So it might be like 2% of businesses in Turkey or 3% of businesses in Turkey that are listed have this dynamic of Euro revenues, Turkish Lira cost. And when everything was short in Turkey, these were short as well. So the Indian guy can go into Turkey, focus only on this particular metric that I want euro revenues and I want Lira expenses and I want to pay three times earnings and it's available on a plan and no one else is interested. Life is great. So like this guy, Jim Cramer says, I'm not a big fan of Jim Cramer, but he says there's always a bull market somewhere. And I agree with that. So there is always value available somewhere because there are 50,000 stocks. There are some stocks that are on the operating, operating table. And there are some countries that are on the operating table. And if you're willing to sift through, it may pay off. Are these companies you're talking about in Turkey listed companies or is this part they of- are, They are listed Francisco. And they are waiting for your buy order. The, <laughs> so I want to tell you something about Turkey you may find interesting. When I made my first trip to the country, by the way, I really enjoy my trips to Turkey. I've enjoyed my trips to Mexico City as well, but I enjoy my trips to Istanbul because when I have the grilled blue fish on the Bosphorus River, which has just been brought in by the fishermen a few hours ago, nothing is better than so I can dine on the blue fish and then I can go buy my three times earning stock. And then I again go dine on the blue fish the next day and it's life is great. So on my first trip to Turkey, which was in 2018, I met this guy, CFO of one of the largest conglomerates in Turkey. And he says to me, Monish, do you know that every country has a national game? Do you know what the national game of Turkey is? I said, why don't you educate me? So he said, well, you know, like in Russia, the national game is chess. In the US, the national game is poker. In China, the national game is Baccarat. And in Turkey, he said, the national game is backgammon. They have all these kind of parlors, like video parlors, like backgammon parlors where people go in and play backgammon. So he said, look, chess, purely skill, no luck. Poker, combination of skill and luck. Bakara and backgammon, pure luck, no skill. Okay. So he said the Turkish stock market, 80% is either held by insiders or foreigners. And that 80% does not trade. It's just static. There's almost no trading of that 80%. The 20% that is quote unquote free float with 
retail Turkish investors and institutional Turkish investors. That turns over every nine days. So the trading volumes of the 20% float is completely turning over every nine days. I mean, if I look at a typical US stock, maybe the entire market cap changes hands two times a year or something, one time a year. This is changing hands 35, 40 times a year, okay? And it's not just 35, 40 times a year. Most Turkish investors, they don't even say I'm investing in the stock market. They say I'm playing in the stock market. They call it playing the stock market, not investing. Their model is that I want to put my money at 10 o'clock, at $10 per share or 10 lira per share. And by one o'clock, I want to sell it for 11 lira and move on. And next day, yeah, again, I'll do it over and over and over. And this other CFO, this lady, very nice lady, she was telling me, I get these calls from retail investors in Turkey. And they think they're like buying carpets. So they ask her, how much, how much you want for one share? So she says to them, it's traded on the stock market. No, no, you tell me how much. Give me a good price. I, I buy it, okay? And after I buy it, how much can I sell it to you tomorrow? These are real conversations, okay? She says, I don't even know how to respond, okay? But this is what happened. So our friend Warren has a quote. You know, he has all these quotes. He has the operating table quote. He says, the stock market is a mechanism to take wealth from the active to the inactive. And I look at this in Turkey with the CFO telling me about this nine, nine days trading volume. I said, they want to give me their wealth. They are saying, please take my wealth. The Indian guy says, okay, no problem. I'll help you. I'll take your wealth, okay? So this, you know, the trading volumes are really high. And the thing is the people who are investing for four hours or three hours or two days or whatever, they don't really care about the business. They don't care what will happen to Costco in 20 years in China. That's not on the radar, okay? They're concerned over what happens to Costco in the next one hour, okay? That's really what they're focused on. So I see this company in Turkey, you know, it's a warehouse operator, largest warehouse operator. 12 million square feet of warehouses. You could liquidate the whole business in six months and you would get seven or $800 million for these warehouses, very prime warehouses. I went and visited them. The market cap when I first invested was $20 million. It was trading at 3% of liquidation value. And I couldn't find anything wrong with it. My Turkish friend who took me to see the company who owned the stock and it looked like a perfectly legitimate company. And then I thought I'd never get any shares out of it. And because of this rapid fire trading, we owned one third of the company for $7 million. Hallelujah. And that 20 million, I think now is like 120 or 140 million. It's gone up a little bit. But the value of the business has gone up even more because they are like, the, the juice seller, all the, either the leases are in euros or they are inflation index. They are borrowing at lira, they're borrowing in lira at 14% when the inflation rate is 80% or 100%. By the time they pay those lira back, they'll pay back 5% of what they borrow. Okay, that it's not a loan, it's a grant. The bank loan is just a grant, you know. So they make, they make money even on the bank. When we have a dynamic like Turkey, and when I find that nobody is interested, you know, it's okay. Indian guy will be interested. And the food is great. And the atmosphere is great. Everything is great. Okay, well, thank you very much, Manish. I think we're two minutes away, so maybe we should be wrapping up, but I think it's been, it's been really insightful to, to hear you, especially 
in these times where you know value investing has become almost a meme by in some in some corners of the investment world but i tend to agree that in the long run you know it's the the probably the way to to prevail in in this industry and i think one of the best takeaways was that it's easier to pick a value stock especially probably for us practitioners it's easier to pick a value stock than to pick a value investor uh, these days. So that was quite interesting. And it was great, you know, having you, especially having Charlie Munger bust overlooking was there in your library. I assume his partner is probably nearby. And so in the name of the CFA Society Mexico, we'd really like to thank you for your time and insights. Thank you, Javier. I really enjoyed the session. I, I'm sorry, my answers tend to be long-winded. So we don't get a chance to go into too many areas, but hopefully we can repeat this at some point. And I, I look forward to the, the con continued dialogue. Thank you. Okay, it would be most delightful to have you back. Uh, All right, thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you, you Manish, thank you. Bye.